Hello, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Happy Tuesday. Going to give you all a minute to get connected. I see all the boxes popping up. Welcome, welcome. Happy Parkinson's Awareness Month. It's a great time to be uh, learning. It's springtime, hopefully, where you are. It's beautiful out. The sun is shining. You're seeing flowers and trees blooming. Um, I would love if you would give us a shout out and let us know where you're joining us from and uh, if it's sunny and warm where you are or still chilly and a little bit snowy. I know we have some staff members on that have uh, cold weather still where they live. So it's always nice when we can see spring flowers and enjoy the sunshine. I want to welcome you today to our program on preventing fractures and people with Parkinson's disease. We're going to be talking about the Topaz study. I'm Nissa Mitchell with PMD Alliance, and we have two wonderful speakers today that I'm excited to introduce you to who's going to be talking about this subject. Um, first with us is Dr. Michael Schwartzchild. He is a movement disorder specialist at Massachusetts General Hospital, and he chairs the executive committee of the Parkinson's study group. And also with this is Dr. Kenneth Lyles, who is a geriatric medicine and metabolic bone disease specialist and a professor of medicine at Duke University and currently serves as the president of the Board of Trustees of the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation. So we have two fantastic speakers today. They're each going to be sharing a portion of it. We're going to start off first with Dr. Schwartzchild. Um, we're going to hear the movement disorder specialist perspective from Parkinson's disease. And so I'm happy to uh, hand this over to him and welcome you, Dr. Schwartzchild. Thank you, Anissa. Thanks everybody for joining in. Thanks to PMD Alliance for hosting us. Um, thanks upfront uh, for all of those who are currently part of Topaz and contributing to what Dr. Lyles and I will try to provide some perspective on for you. Um, as Anissa kindly mentioned, um, I'm a movement disorders neurologist based at Mass General, where I run a translational neuroscience laboratory, uh, but also get to wear a hat more on the distal end of the of the of the bridge from the science uh, to therapeutics uh, in leading the Parkinson Study Group of North America, which is a a partner contributing through its sites uh, to the Topaz uh, study. And um, on the briefer end, uh, before Dr. Lyles provides perspective on the science, the clinical science uh, linking bone health to Parkinson's disease, I'm just going to provide some color commentary and some context on uh, Parkinson's research and how Topaz fits into that. Uh, and uh, one of the, the themes that I'll, I'll highlight because it's so nicely addressed and uncommonly so by the Topaz study and, and everyone's efforts in it is what's, what's typically a challenge in healthcare uh, that you may be very familiar with, the, the siloing of all the specialties. Uh, and uh, certainly, um, you know, for better or for worse, uh, while good uh, uh, Parkinson's care comes in part from the expertise of, of uh, working for many of you with a neurologist or even in, for, for some of you, a movement disorders neurologist. Uh, the, the downside is that uh, um, our science and our clinical work is often very separated from other caregivers. So while you may see a brain specialist, uh, for most of you that's coupled hopefully with a primary care physician, but often with others who are, are trying to help from their particular expertise, for example, cardiology, uh, focusing on the heart or eye doctor, or in the case of, uh, of bone health, either a bone specialist or, or an endocrinologist. And uh, it evokes the um, fabled uh, poetry of Rudyard Kipling here in a minor adaptation that uh, speaks to the uh, ballad of the brain and bone. Oh, brain is brain and bone is bone and never the twain shall meet. Uh, is uh, blazing somewhere in poetry lore, but the subsequent lines of that poem highlight the the, the power of actually uh, different perspectives coming together. And that's what I hope uh, we'll highlight with this study, which is again, fairly unusual 
uh, in Parkinson's research, um, working with uh, systems and and uh, challenges, health challenges that fall outside the brain, let alone movement disorders in the brain. So let me just give some very broad perspective on the context starting. I'll just run through uh, ever so quickly, a couple hundred years of Parkinson's history and uh, what we call Parkinson's, why we call it that, uh, and uh, uh, highlight how we initially, and, and for all of you for the most part, uh, personally define it, the disease in terms of its symptoms and how over the years we've come to understand it in part uh, by the pathology in the brain, uh, the cell changes and losses, um, how that's led to symptoms, the different kinds of symptoms, most classically uh, focus on, uh, on the movement disorder. Again, in our silo for many of us, in treating uh, Parkinson's disease, but a, a growing appreciation uh, for the non-motor features in the brain uh, and then even outside the brain. And uh, I ultimately, we hoped that this knowledge is gonna uh, slow down the disease if not prevent it outright. But here's a little timeline that's very schematized and highlights over a couple hundred years uh, for how things, and this is really highlighted not so much as a history lesson, but as a source of the hopefulness of how quickly we are picking up the pace of understanding the disease. So despite the centuries uh, from when it was first characterized uh, by Sir James Parkinson, uh, uh, who, who just made observations, uh, how quickly things are picking up. Um, so, but um, those first uh, descriptions that uh, he made, um, in England uh, that came to take on the, the name that uh, we use for, the, for this disease as characterized by, by a handful of cardinal features that um, you're all too familiar with. Um, a rest tremor typically on one side, slowness uh, of movement, stiffness or rigidity of movement, and uh, usually a little bit later, but uh, quite distinctively and particularly relevant to the disability that can develop with Parkinson's uh, so-called postural instability or, or, or uh, losing one's balance when uh, set off, off over one's center of gravity. Uh, so it was pretty much a hundred years before there was really uh, a major advance in understanding the underlying uh, biology of the disease and identifying that the brain was the source and that uh, there was pathology uh, as depicted here, just even here without even looking under the microscope, but um, a, a identification that a region at the very top of the brainstem, uh, this black stripe that you can see here, just looking at a, a section of of the top of the brainstem uh, from someone who passed away without the disease, that if compared to someone who did uh, have Parkinson's in life, that same stripe or section uh, is blanched, uh, reflecting the loss of pigment, which reflects the loss of brain cells in this region. Here's that sort of cutaway at the top of the brainstem or the spinal cord. If you slip it back in place, here's that black substance uh, reflecting brain cells that are filled with pigment um, that uh, make a chemical called dopamine that gets released at the twigs and the nerve terminals a little higher up in the brain. And it's that release of dopamine that sort of lubricates the chemical circuits and facilitates normal movement. And that was a major advance 100 years ago and over 50 years ago now that led to a series of major insights into not just the anatomy of the disease, but the chemistry, as mentioned, the loss of those brain cells leading to the loss of dopamine and uh, accounting for the, the, much of the difficulty, at least of the movement component of Parkinson's disease, which in relatively short order led to one of the mainstay therapies that really hasn't been surpassed uh, in the overall movement treatment of the disease, which is focused on replacing that dopamine uh, with levodopa, a precursor dopamine still being uh, the most effective of those strategies. Uh, and, and that the idea is it facilitates movement uh, because it uh, replaces the dopamine in those nerve terminals in those circuits that I mentioned. Uh, so one of the over the last 25 years, one of the, the great uh, advances, which is just really catching up to anybody who lives with the disease, is that it's much more than just a loss of dopamine producing brain cells in the substantia nigra as depicted here, uh, sort of the tip of the iceberg, even within the brain, 
all uh, multiple other regions are affected that in, that affect other systems besides dopamine producing symptoms and that leads in the brain and even outside the brain to uh, a constellation of challenges health challenges that uh, that ends up interfacing with the the siloed system that i mentioned i believe i am represented here as uh, uh could be a little bit worse i suppose at the very back end but the uh, movement disorders neurologist is here is uh, focused on walking i think and parkinsonism as it's defined motorically whereas cognitive symptoms sleep disorders uh constipation out, uh, and and someone here all throughout, probably the bones of the beast, uh, are really the focus of other uh, clinicians and other areas of research. Uh, so uh, it's really been a, a major advance, uh, again, with apologies of sorts, because we're just catching up to the real lives of people dealing with Parkinson's, that it's much more than movement disorder, and that there's many non-motor features as well, uh, both within the brain and outside the brain. Uh, and I'll just highlight that some of the motor features can interact with some of the non-motor features uh, like cognitive dif difficulty to pull in other challenges that are the subject of the Topaz study uh, with, with falls and, and breaking bones uh, being a, a, a reflection of these multiple systems get involved with cognitive difficulty and balance difficulty. Uh, it, it can be a, uh, a um, fracturing experience to be sure. Uh, so the Topaz study is really a, a great example of trying to bridge between silos. This is a uh, puts a face on the leadership of the Topaz study, along with Steve Cummings. Uh, my colleague Carly Tanner is a movement disorder specialist, also in the leadership of the Parkinson study group, who has designed the study and teamed up with experts across silos, if you will. And forgive the uh, the um, uh, the glowing. Uh, um, chirping birds and the like uh, a metaphor here with the rainbow, but really it is an unusual uh, opportunity to actually work across these silos, across these disciplines to try to bridge this gap. And I'll just just mention, since it's just sort of topical at the rate uh, to reflect on the rate at which the disease uh, research is progressing, uh, just since it was just in the last few last few days, uh, there was a, a story highlighting the work of Michael J. Fox, who most of you are familiar with in the work of his foundation um, that uh, just led to a breakthrough in sort of the science that you'll probably be hearing more about. But putting it in context for him, turns out over the last year, he's highlighted breaking multiple bones himself uh, and the need at, to try to understand and treat the disease at all its levels, including through the new uh, lab test. Uh, targeting alpha synuclein that is a reflection of the many different uh, collaborative ways um, research progress is being made. So the Topaz study falls in here in a sort of unmet need that's recently been appreciated by collaborating across disciplines. That's led to the Topaz study that you'll hear a little bit more about um, if you're if this is an introduction for you um, and just more context from Dr. Um, Ken uh, Lyles, who uh, after whose talk he's going to follow, there's Ken, whom you'll see in person momentarily, uh, will we'll hold off on answering questions, uh, but please feel free to jot down any that arose from what I discussed or from what Ken will present to you so that at the end we might have a nice exchange. And that's his term, not mine, a bonehead, which uh, for which I have now greater respect in getting to work with Ken and colleagues. So uh, with that, I'll uh, switch over here and stop sharing. All right. Thank you so much. Now we are going to toss this over to Dr. Lyles, our bonehead expert here. We're excited to hear from him and a little bit more specifically about this Topaz study. So Dr. Lyles, when you are ready to share your screen, all right, well, let me let me see if I can do it. If or if I blow it up, you'll be here to help me. We're here at the ready. Well, can would you throw my slides up? We and I'll can you do that without any difficulty? And then I'll try to move them forward. Yes, Calissa, I think sharing it right now, and then she will give you remote access. 
While we're waiting, let me take a minute just to thank both Anissa and uh, Olissa for having us on today and keeping an old man like me, an old bonehead straight. Computers scare me to death, but uh, I have some slides here that, how are we doing? Do you have them ready? Do you need me to share them, Calissa? Okay. You know, it's just technology is wonderful. And even um, those of us who do it every day, still sometimes we get- Oh, here we go. I'm, different I'm, screens and, and things up that it takes us a minute. Perfect. That is- I think we have my key. slide. So again, I need to thank you too. I need to thank the PMD Alliance and then I'm here representing a portion of the Topaz trial, but Michael just did a phenomenal job of setting me up. He and I have been slumming together now for about six years and it's been uh, a great deal of fun. And I wanna share with you that what I am is an internist and endocrinologist and 42 years ago, the Department of Veterans Affairs trained me to become a geriatrician. And what that really means is first, I'm passionate about older people's care, but because of my endocrinology background, I chose to subspecialize. And what I'm really interested in is frail older people that have had problems with their skeleton, okay? So you're going to hear the story of the Topaz trial but I have to set it up, so be patient with me. Let's see, I click that and it won't advance. I'd like to advance, if you would, to my next slide. Okay. My university will not let me open my mouth to anyone unless I reveal my conflicts of interest. I am involved with the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation. You can see that 50% of my time is supported uh, by research funds and you see that. You can see that I do consulting work. Uh, 15 years ago, we created a company with several colleagues to try to help manage physicians um, consulting work but we return all that money for educational purposes at Duke and Stanford. And then you need to understand that I am conflicted because I have four patents dealing with the drug. We're gonna be talking about this afternoon, uh, is Zoledronic acid. So forewarned is forearmed. Now what I, what, you've already been warned that I'm a bonehead. So let me have the next slide, please. And you need to understand my objectives for wanting to talk to you. First, I want you to understand why people with Parkinson's are at higher risk for fractures than other people. And remember, whenever we're gonna talk to you about risks, these risks are compared to people of the same race and age as yourself. And you're gonna see there's some appalling bits of information. The other thing to make sure you know is the uh, Alliance has agreed that these slides will be available to you after the talk, both my slides and Michael's are to be shared with you. So you don't need to write anything down. You just listen to me if you will. And then you'll have these slides if you want to go back and review what I've said. I want you to understand that people with Parkinson's have more functional disability and longer recovery periods after fractures. But what is the positive point to make with you is that treatments to reduce fracture rates in patients with Parkinson's disease are present and research and opportunities are available to better understand this risk. Next slide, please.
This is work that was done by one of our trial leaders, Steve Cummings. You're going to get to see a picture of his smiling face very shortly. But what is known is if you have Parkinson's disease compared to colleagues the same age as you, you have a marked increased risk of having fractures. I'm gonna to explain to you what these fractures do to you in a minute, but you have about a twofold risk for fractures. And the problem is people with Parkinson's disease, when they have these fractures, their disability is worse than people who don't have Parkinson's disease. The study has been published just a couple of years ago. And Stephen was doing this work as you'll hear, as we were preparing to win the grant from the National Institute of Aging to show how devastating these things are in patients with PD. Next slide, please. So what is the impact of these fractures on you folks? They occur two to three times more frequently in Parkinson's than in people who don't have the disease. But look very carefully. You have four times the increased risk of having a hip fracture. But if you're blessed to make it to the age of 90 and you're a woman, you already one third of you are going to have fractures of the hip. But it's increased if you have Parkinson's. So it's a horrible problem. The other thing we know from very carefully looking at people that have had fractures with their Parkinson's disease, less than 5%, less than one in 20, get any approved therapy that we know reduces subsequent fracture rates, okay? We also know that once you've had these fractures, there's greater disability, and it takes longer to return to normal function or pre-fracture function level. Next slide, please. You're going to medical school this afternoon. I hope you're able to see that I'm putting my pointer on my screen. You may not be able to, but that's a vertebral fracture. That's a normal vertebra. That's one that's been fractured. The lowest one has been fractured across the top. The, 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 this one here has been uh, fractured, but this one's been turned into a pancake. The upper one is substantially deformed. And remember that many of these fractures don't come to medical attention because older people thought they were supposed to get bent over and stooped and lose height and have back pain. That's totally incorrect. And these fractures are bad because they double your risk of death and increase your risk of a hip fracture two and a half times. Next slide. This is a hip fracture. On the left-hand side, you see a normal femoral neck. That's the ball. And then you see the bone coming from it. Look at the ball on the left side. It's been fractured. That's a femoral neck fracture, okay? If you have one of these, you have a 25 to 30% risk of death in the next 12 months. These are very substantial things. And remember, PD patients have four times the risk that normal age match people do. Next slide. We use the term Collie's fracture, but you'll see the, as you look at this picture of a hand, you see a little bit of deformity on the left-hand side. It's a little harder to see in the middle, but do you see the jagged bone on the right-hand panel there? That's someone who may have tripped across one of those uh, concrete stanchions in a parking lot or slipped on some ice. You have one of these fractures, it increases your risk of subsequent fractures. 
Let's now go to several lists I'm going to show you. Just look at the list and realize if you want to refer to it, you can get the slides. Next slide, please. This is a substantial health problem. There are 12.3 million Americans 2020 that have this disease. There are now somewhere between 280 and 300,000 hip fractures yearly in older patients. I've already said this, 20 to 30% of people that have the fracture are dead in 12 months. Cost is amazing, okay? And remember that fractures, this is something we have to harp about in the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation. This exceeds heart attacks, stroke, and breast cancer. And the cost for people over age 55 exceeds the cost spent for heart attacks, strokes, and breast cancer. There's something that if we can do something about this, it's really important. Next slide. There are things that put you at increased risk. I'm not gonna read the list, but direct your attention to the bottom line here. We now know from work done by Dr. Cummings and then a group at the University of Alabama, Birmingham showed that two Devastating chronic neurologic diseases, Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis markedly increase your risk of fracture, mostly because of the falling, okay? When you fall, you can't catch yourself as well, and it's well-documented in Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis. Next slide, please. The good news. The good news, folks, is there things we can do for this. This is a busy slide. You will be able to look at it, but first, we need to work on stopping bad habits. You shouldn't smoke. You should limit your alcohol. You should avoid using sedating medications or things like Xanax or Valium or Librium. You also wanna work on fall prevention, you also want to do as much exercise and physical therapy as possible. We're going to talk more about vitamin D, 800 to 1,000 IUs, international units a day, and calcium supplements are important when you receive therapies, okay? These are all approved. They work. They make a difference. Remember, though, only 5% or less of people with Parkinson's ever get offered these therapies. That's what the Topaz trial wants to change. Go ahead. Next slide. One of the important things about this is over the last, it's now about 28 years, there have been medications approved by the Food and Drug Administration that indicate that clearly are they're indicated for treatment of osteoporosis to prevent fractures or to reduce the risk of a subsequent fracture once you've already had one. One of the principal investigators for our trial, the Topaz trial that we'll go to in a, another slide or two, Steve Cummings led the trial to get raloxifene or Avista approved for two of the drugs called bisphosphonates. Those are the drugs Fosamax, Actinel, Boniva, and Reclast, which are approved. The drug denosumab, Dr. Cummings also led, that's Prolia. All these drugs now reduce fracture rates in people that have sustained them. Okay, there are some other medications that are given usually by injection. They are given more frequently daily for the drugs teriparatide and abaloparatide. Romasosumab is given on a monthly basis 
those drugs we're not going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about a bisphosphonate called zoledronic acid in just a minute to explain a little bit of why we think this drug can substantially help people that have Parkinson's disease or are at high risk for fracture. Next slide. You might wonder what Michael and I do as we work together to talk about trying to help people with Parkinson's disease. And as I have, when I was asked to do this talk about six weeks ago, I got very excited because what came to mind is Mark Twain's famous statement to a man with a hammer, everything looks a lot like a nail. Now you might think that's a negative statement. For a group of us though, six years ago, Steve Cummings, Carly Tanner, Michael Sport, Child, myself, and four or five other experts, we began to put our heads together six years ago to figure out one, what can we do to help people with Parkinson's disease reduce their fracture rates? Because the exciting thing is boneheads got together with neurologists and looked at different scopes or different views of the problem. And we think we now have a way to try to help people that are at huge risk for fracture. And again, 95% of the people, they're never offered any kind of therapy. So next slide, please. Here are the people. Now, you might think Steve Cummings was a carpenter. He's not. He is a world-class leader. He's a general internist who has spent years designing and conducting multiple trials in the osteoporosis field. And he is one of the two leaders of something we chose to call the Topaz trial, treatment of Parkinson's and Zoledronic acid. That's what it stands for. Beside him is Carly Tanner. Carly is a neurologist. She has major expertise in Parkinson's disease, as does Michael. She's part of this Parkinson's study group. She is fascinated by the disabilities that come with this disease. And one of the other hallmarks and trademarks of her work have been ways to assess people with Parkinson's disease, either electronically or in their home, reducing respondent burden to have those people participate in trials. Six years ago, this coming August, or I remember Steve Cummings calling me, said, Ken, Carly Tanner and I at UCSF want to do a trial to change fracture rates in people with Parkinson's. You know a little bit about zoledronic acid. Would you be willing to help us? I said, there's a bear in the woods, and you can put the other word in that I would have said. I'm known to be a little bit crazy. But the point is, Six or eight of us people got together who are totally intent on driving a nail because we have a hammer and we are very intent on trying to change the fracture rate and reduce disability in people with Parkinson's disease. So how are we going to do that? Carly and Steve let us, it took us 25 months to get the Topaz trial. We had to send it to the NIA a number of times they didn't like this, they didn't like that. Finally, we convinced them that we would be able to do it. And in fact, now there are 200 people who are part of this trial who run around with hammers trying to put nails into the fracture rate with Parkinson's disease. Next slide. We're using a drug. In America, it's known as reclast. It is gone generic. It's an intravenous bisphosphonate. And what this drug does is suppress bone breakdown and makes the bone stronger. I began working with this drug in 1989. 
I have continued to work with it. I feel very comfortable using it. The drug has two major uses. It is used to treat osteoporosis in more frequent dosing and larger doses it is used to suppress cancer in, to keep it out of the bone if you have multiple myeloma or breast cancer. But it's given intravenously. It's been shown in a number of populations to reduce fractures by 30 to 35%. What's most exciting is that this drug, once you give it, is effective for two years, maybe three years. So you don't have to take a pill or get a shot frequently. That's a pretty effective drug that has quite a long ability to protect against fractures. And then one of the things our group at Duke was the first to show, but has now been replicated by other groups is there's a 28% reduction in mortality when this was given to people who had hip fractures. And remember, hip fractures are bad. I've already told you that once a man or a woman over the age of 55 has a hip fracture, they have a 20 to 30% reduction in their, or a 20, excuse me, they have a 20 to 30% increase in their risk of death in the next 12 months. This drug reduces the death rate. There's still some controversy. I personally believe it's because it reduces um, damage from heart attacks, but that's gonna be sorted out. The point is, this is a very positive effect of the drug. Next slide, please. So this is a complicated slide, but we have to give tribute to Carly Tanner for her brilliance and how we put this slide together, how we put the study together. If you will look at the left-hand side, you see what we call referral sources. So we need patients with Parkinson's disease. I wanna emphasize, we're still in the business of recruiting. We have a little over 40% of the people we need but we need more people. And the only way we're gonna answer if we figured out a way to reduce fracture rates is to ask people with Parkinson's disease or over the age of 60, who are still able to ambulate to consider participating in our trial. One way is to get them is from health systems where we can see people that have Parkinson's and invite them to do it. Then, the people and uh, the Fox Foundation can help us. We advertise on social media, the Parkinson study group, and then the Parkinson Foundation, which is also part of this trial, very helpful to us. They also help recruit patients. The beauty is if you're interested in doing this, you don't ever have to leave home. If you have a neurologist, that neurologist can send your information in, or you can call the Parkinson's Foundation. They can get your name, and you even can sign uh, informed consent electronically. And trust me, it's possible to do, because about three years ago, Dana knew what a klutz I was, and Dana, uh, Kreitzel, who's the study coordinator at UCSL, sent me a form and I completed all the information to enroll in the trial and sign the consent form. So if I can do it, anyone can. But the thing is that you sign the uh, consent form electronically and then your records, if your neurologist has sent it in, People at UCSF look at it. If not, again, this is Dr. Tanner's wisdom. Dr. Tanner has figured out how you can do a video visit on either your iPhone or your computer to see if your Parkinson's will 
allow, or if you've got Parkinson's and you can enter the trial. Again, I know it works because they called me on my iPhone and I did it sitting in this chair in my office at Duke University Medical Center, all right? Then we mail you some vitamin D, which I'll explain a little bit further in a minute. But then the thing is we have a group of nurses that their home office is in Denver, Colorado, but they're all over the United States and they will come to your home, examine you, make sure that you're healthy. They do an oral exam to make sure that there are no troubles with your mouth. They check your kidney function with a quick blood test and then they give you the drug and then they leave. And then we just follow you, ask you questions on your fracture and see how you do over the next couple of years. It's a very simple thing, but the nice thing is you don't ever have to leave home. Next slide, please. This is a drug that is given intravenously. And we tell our patients that about five to 10% of the people may have a little bit of a flu-like illness. You know this going in, as long as your mouth is in good shape and you don't have any dental problems, I'll explain that a bit more in a minute, then you should have no trouble taking this medication. But it is proven in a number of groups of people at high risk for fracture to reduce fracture rates. And also in people with hip fractures, it does reduce all-cause mortality. So we've set up quite a safety net. We have safety measures that include male vitamin D that will come to your home that you take for seven to 10 days. We then have special research nurses that make a home visit. They perform the blood tests. They check your kidney function. They examine your mouth and teeth to make sure that there are no trouble with broken teeth, gum disease, or the like. And in fact, I've been on call for the trial. I take all calls when there are questions about uh, the uh, oral exam that a nurse does. They send me a photograph that comes to a secure Duke box. I look at the photograph and I say whether the person can be in the trial or not. My last phone call was nine o'clock this past Saturday night. Unfortunately, somebody in the state of Washington had a broken tooth and very severe gum disease. I'm not gonna show you that picture, but unfortunately that man through the trial nurse was told, okay, he needs to see a dentist for the tooth removal and to have some treatment of his gum disease and then in a couple of months, he'd be good for the trial. If there are any questions, as I say, the people uh, call me, I look at the picture, we make the decision. If I didn't have the next slide. Two weeks ago, I was visiting our grandson in Lawrence, Kansas, so I had him take a picture of my mouth. I hope this won't uh, ruin your lunches or your afternoon snack, but that's my mouth taken with my cell phone, okay? And the reason you need to see that is you see the left side, you see the left side of my cheek. And many times those pictures come to me and people either have a cold sore or they've chewed on their gum, but our nurses are very cautious. So they make sure there are no problems. And you can see some of my teeth. I didn't show you my gum line, but the point is this works. And our 17-year-old grand, grandson made this slide for me to put in the talk. Next slide, please. When you've agreed to take this medicine and you're gonna have a 50-50 chance of getting either the active drug, zolotronic acid, also known as Reclass, or you're gonna get a placebo. That's the only way we're gonna know that we've changed people's fracture rates. You're then given 
the infusion over 45 minutes, they give you two Tylenol. You're advised to make sure you take the Tylenol for three days and you're given a number to call that if you have trouble, Dr. Tanner and colleagues at UCSF cover a phone line for the neurology side, or if you need a bonehead, you get the old man, that's me. If there are any problems you have by feeling puny after you've had the infusion. This next point is critically important. Since the Topaz study has been started, PD experts have developed a questionnaire to assess Parkinson's disease symptoms and functional ability before and after receiving the study drug. That's going to be either the zoledronic acid or placebo. Some Topaz participants are evaluated by PD experts using telemedicine. I've told you about that before. <clears throat> And before more than three months or three months later, determine whether there are long-term changes in their Parkinson's disease. While a few people may have short-term flu-like symptoms, I've told you about that, immediately after the infusion, to date we have no evidence of long-term worsening of Parkinson's disease. And that was a very critical point, again, that Carly Tanner, Michael was involved in this, put our heads together to make sure we're absolutely not harming the people who help us with this. We are very hopeful and predict we will have somewhere between a 25 to a 30 pre 33% reduction in the fractures that are so common in people that have PD. Let me have the next slide. This is how you contact us if you're interested in becoming a participant in the Topaz trial. There's a helpline, it's open now. And the number is there for you to call. Again, this slide will be part of the package you have, but you can call and they can get you information. The other thing that happened is periodically they'll come and say, Ken, there's someone in such and such. I remember a delightful guy in Massachusetts who wanted to talk to me. I just called him up and we, I tried to address his concerns and I believe he enrolled in the trial. Can I have the next slide, please? The real, the face of this trial are not the boneheads of the neurologists that you see in these slides, but these are the people that really are the face of this trial are the certified mobile research nurses employed by PCM trial. These are wonderful people. We cover 95% of the zip codes in the United States and these nurses call and make the appointment with the patient. They ask them a few questions before they get there, but they go to people's homes where they go in, they evaluate them, they talk to them, they explain what's gonna happen, they look at the mouth, they do the chemistry by just the finger stick. If that's fine, they go ahead and do the infusion over 45 minutes. Why do I know they're great people? Because they call me, usually between 6 a.m. and 10 o'clock every night. I probably get a call every other week since this trial has started when they have a question and we decide whether the picture they sent me allows the person to participate or not. Many times I may ask them to go back and talk to the patient and ask a question and maybe send me another picture. Let me have the next button, please. These are registered nurses. They are trained during the COVID pandemic when we were allowed to start again. They had all the training to make sure our patients were safe. And then there are, let me have the last button, please. 
They're also certified in good clinical practice. These are delightful people. I don't see their face. I just get their text and talk to them by telephone, but they have done a phenomenal job for us. Next slide. <clears throat> so what have I tried to do? I hope you realize first, I'm passionate about this. I'm running around driving, trying to drive nails anytime I get a chance into the coffin of what will be these huge fracture rates in people with Parkinson's. And I and Michael represent 200 people who are part of this trial, all driven to try to get us a way to help reduce this fracture rate. So I hope you understand why patients with Parkinson's disease are at a higher risk of skeletal fracture than other people. I want you to understand that people with Parkinson's, when they have these fractures, have longer recovery periods. Whether you've got Parkinson's or not, these fractures are bad and need to be treated, and they're treatments that work. I want you to recognize their treatments to reduce fracture rates in patients with PD and that their research opportunities. We have one. I hope you will give consideration to doing the Topaz trial if you're over 60, you're able to walk in any way, shape, or fashion, and you're willing to consider this. Let me have the last slide. Again, thank you to Anissa, Clolissa, the, uh, let me get it straight, the PMD Alliance, my colleagues at UCSF, PCM Trials, and we also acknowledge tremendous support from both the Parkinson Foundation and the National Institute on Aging in making this trial possible. I hope there are times for questions. I'm delighted to have been able to talk to you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. So we do actually have a few questions. Um, and I just wanna say like, uh, we've highlighted many studies through the years um, that people can engage in. I think this is one of the most accessible studies for people, and it's hugely important. As you both mentioned, fractures are a high risk in Parkinson's and certainly can lead to complicated hospital stays and rehab and, and just a number of problems that impact quality of life. So the fact that we have a study such as this is just fantastic and, and is very important. So if anyone is at all interested in engaging, we have a couple of times and drop the link into the chat. I recommend you uh, save your chat so you can refer back to that again. So I wanted to, I know we've had a couple of questions about some of the aspects of the study. And then also there were some things that you talked about um, in terms of like, protective devices. So there was someone wanting to know if you could explain what a hip protector is. This is just something people might want to know that doesn't particularly right. uh, relate to the study itself. Okay, let's, let's do the hip protectors and talk about them. What, what, there are certain types of hip protectors which if worn have shown reductions in fracture rates in people in long-term care facilities. Those are nursing. One of the problems is not all the trials have been positive. In other words, it hasn't always worked. And there's some controversy about it. There also is a little bit of concern that wearing them may be a real nuisance and people don't like to do it. One of my colleagues, Doug Keel, who also is at Harvard, did that trial. But that's what we're talking about with hip protectors and they have been used in the past. I don't think there's been the wide uptake of hip protectors that it was originally thought to have, or originally thought was going to happen. 
Okay, so I want to get to some specific questions because we have a, a lot of them and we have like five minutes. So um, one of the key ones I think is that just came out actually is the question of is the objective to reduce fractures by preventing falls to begin with or lessening the impact of falls by healing fractures better? Okay, what we hope to do is to make the bone stronger and to put it very simply that you'll bounce, not break when you hit the floor. Okay, it's, it's to make you give those bones strength so that when you have the fall, you do not fracture and the bones are stronger. Did that answer the question simply? I think so. Yes, I'm getting a thumbs up from the person who asked it. I, I, <laughs> That's great. So um, there's been a few questions about uh, bone density scans. Are these not done? Yeah. Okay. We, when we thought about when we thought about this, remember you're talking to a geriatrician and a bonehead, and the term is respondent burden. We felt that if we had to make you poor folks go get a bone density, your risk is so high with these fractures. If you're over 60, you've already qualified. You have qualified for treatment for osteoporosis based on just your fall frequency and the like. So you would cross that threshold and the doctor would offer you this therapy whether you had a bone density or not. And remember, you're gonna to have to go someplace else to have the bone densities done. Great point, but we argued about it. And the funding agency, the National Institute on Aging, when they saw that data from the, one of the first slides I showed you, said, we don't think you need a bone density. These people are gonna qualify without having the bone density, okay? Let's keep firing and I can stay longer if you'll stay, <laughs> if you'll hang with This me. is very okay. good. Um, we had a few people ask, uh, so you mentioned the dental exam and yes. if there was any tooth decay or any problems in the mouth um, that they couldn't do the study. Could you explain yeah, I, why? I, go ahead. Can you explain why? And they wanted to know yeah. if there's let me, concerns let me tell you about what. drug we, class. I'm sorry. If, if you have, if you get this drug, you have a one in 10,000 chance of what's called osteonecrosis of the jaw. Okay. If though you're going to need, if you have a broken or damaged tooth that's going to need to come out and you're going to have that out within three months of having the study drug infusion, you'll have an increased risk of developing osteonecrosis of the jaw. If you have very severe, what, what some people call periodontal disease, some people call pyrrhea, which is retraction of the gum from the teeth, and sometimes uh, there's some white material there, you don't want to be part of this trial. If you went to a doctor anyway to get Fosamax, Actonel, or Reclass, they would tell you to go see a dentist to get that fixed because you don't want to increase the risk of having this osteonecrosis of the jaw, okay? That's why that's done. And we're, we're pretty cheeky about this. As best we know, this is the first trial that's ever used iPhones to take the pictures as our grandson did of my mouth and using that, we have all these pictures saved at Duke. If anybody ever wants to come in and question our judgment and so far we've been recruiting, it'll be, Dana, you can correct me whether it's three or four years in May, we've had no trouble with osteonecrosis of the jaw with any of our subjects, but we have the safeguard of having the picture taken by the nurse it's sent to me, I review it. If there's a question I call and the nurse talks to the patient, we say, yes, you're fine, or no, you need to see your dentist, we'll have to put you on hold. Next question. Okay. 
Um, so you, you said how long the study has been going on. How long will the study remain? Dana, don't we go to 2020, February 2026? Yes, that is currently. Yeah. So participants will be followed, um, you know, probably for at least three years. Some people who joined earlier will have a longer follow-up period, um, but that's about uh, probably at least three years of just, and that's, we just follow, send you questionnaires every four months to ask if you've had a fracture. So it's pretty simple. And this is, don't make Michael feel bad. You got any questions for Michael? I don't mind answering. Michael's a major part of this trial. Well, there hasn't really been any specific to Parkinson's. It's been mostly, or how that relates to the study, um, more about, you know, just having some uh, interest in how long and what are the potential side effects. And we've been um, blessed to have a few people in this um, audience today that are actually already a part of the study that are, you know, making comments that, you know, so far they haven't really had any side effects. And so that's been very helpful. Certainly, uh, Dr. Schwartzchild, if you have anything that you would like to add to, to this discussion, please feel free to, to jump in. Um, I, I don't want to leave you out, like Dr. Lyle said. That's okay. Uh, everyone in the Zoom room here is, is as much, if not more, an expert than I, but the bone questions, uh, I, I think that's the real opportunity to tap into Ken's wonderful knowledge. So part, part I'm not this, offended. Uh, really, we need to thank everybody in, on the call if you pay income tax because you're supporting this study. And that's really important. This is one of the things I believe is is wise use of federal funds, and it comes from the National Institute on Aging. Um, to go back, though, if there are any Topaz participants on the call, we sure appreciate it. And I just cannot stress enough how much we're concerned to protect our patients to make sure we don't worsen any of their problems, okay? Because this is a pretty novel approach. If Steve Cummings and Carly will say, if we're able to show this, then to follow up on the question about bone densities, if you're over 60 and have Parkinson's disease and we can change the fracture rates, you won't need to go have a bone density. Hopefully it will be uh, covered to get the infusion. And we, we another thing we've done very differently, we did our homework getting this trial again. Most places in the US give zoledronic acid over 15 minutes, okay? That's how the trial that you saw referenced in 2007 was done. One of the members of our study, Susan Greenspan at Pittsburgh, had done a trial where she found treating older people with an infusion for 45 minutes as opposed to 15, cut this flu-like symptoms from 40% to about 10%. And so that was, Susan's part of the trial and we adopted that from day one. We also, uh, we're pretty hard boiled about the fact we want you to take this Tylenol because if you'll take the Tylenol, you have much, uh, you have a decrease in the symptoms you have. There's nothing wrong with having the flu-like illness. It doesn't mean it's not working. It may even mean that it's working a little bit better, but we'll have that data when the trial is over, okay? Are there other questions in this? Well, some of them are, are somewhat specific to eligibility requirements, like if they've had previous diagnosis of cancer, such as breast cancer, and they're cancer-free, can they participate? Um, and so is there like a, a better way to kind of blanket address like any eligibility or exclusionary? Yeah, you can't be in this trial if you're on treatment for osteoporosis. Okay, that you can't. If you're getting Fosamax, Actinel, Proli, or you can't be on. Okay, you can't be on the trial if you've had a hip fracture. Okay, that, uh, 
you're at huge risk for further fractures, so you can't do it. Again, they can contact you or they can contact the Parkinson Foundation. We're serious as a heart attack about this trial, and the questions can be sent to me or to Mike Ward or others. We, again, we're very passionate about getting people to help us with this trial. And I just dropped the link in the chat again, just because it's easier if it's at the bottom and you can just link from it as opposed to worrying about saving your chat. But I know we're out of time and hopefully uh, everyone that is joined here has learned as much today as I have about this and how important a study like this is. I think it's phenomenal that you're doing this and I'm very thankful that some of you that are involved in the study have hopped on and have given us some feedback in the chat about your experience. So I really appreciate that. Um, I appreciate you, Dr. Lyles. It's been wonderful hearing about this and you know, learning about the impact of these uh, fractures that they have on people. And of course, with Dr. Schwartzchild, just giving us that perspective from the uh, Parkinson's world. So the two of you uh, co-presenting has really given us a full picture. So I wanna thank both of you very much for, for joining us today. Thanks everyone on the call. Thank you, Michael, a pleasure, young man. Likewise, thank you all for joining in the call and this whole uh, enterprise. It's, it's uh, very helpful for others as well. Much appreciated. Well, and I'll just last bit of uh, reminders. This is recorded. Uh, so it will be available for you to view in the next day or so. And there are slides, both of them have contributed their slides for you to be able to go back and look at the notes that they had. So that is available too. So thank you very much for joining in today. And in PMD style, uh, what we like to do to thank our speakers is that we ask everyone to turn on their video if they don't have it on and give you across the US and above or uh, beyond the wave of gratitude to thank you for the two experts that we had today. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. And I hope the rest of you have a great day. Take care. <laughs>